I think we've all heard a ton about AI over the course of the past few years. ChatGPT, deepfakes, that racist Microsoft Twitter bot. But AI has been around for a really, really long time. So what's the difference between artificial intelligence and generative artificial intelligence? What are the ethical implications surrounding the use of generative AI and the ethical ambiguities that are part of its creation? It's way too much to cover in just one podcast episode, but we are at the very least going to begin today. My name is Eric Bowman. I'm the Communications Specialist at the Canadian Psychological Association, or CPA, and this is Mindful. Coming up in February, the CPA will be holding a conference on AI in BC. You'll be hearing more about it on this podcast as we get closer to the date, and you can keep checking our social media or, if you're a member, our monthly newsletter as we gain and share more details. At the moment, though, it's at the stage where it's just starting out as the concept of a plan. And when it happens, it will be coming on the heels of the first of its kind conference, a virtual professional development summit for educators that's happening this October. It's a passion project for today's guests. Layla Shaheen and Nia Pazoki are both students at Simon Fraser University. I'm hoping we can start just by having the two of you introduce yourselves. Layla, let's start with you. Yes, so I am currently a master's student at Simon Fraser University. My research focuses on the intersection between geopolitics and that developing emerging digital world order. So that includes things like central bank digital currency and its increasing adoption in that developing economies and the geopolitical implications of that, as well as the rising influence of tech giants in terms of their impact on actual geopolitical matters like, you know, Starlink and who has access to that, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I'm happy to be here today. <laughs> happy to have you and thank you. And Nia. Hi everyone, I'm Nia. My first role is I'm a doctorate candidate in educational psychology. I have a double master's in educational psychology and applied linguistics. I also am a sessional instructor at SFU. I teach learning disabilities, education 424. My research interest is I work with refugee kids with special needs. I do community-based research and yeah, it's all about the community and happy to be here. Thank you for having us. Well, and thank you for being here. And uh, you, I reached out to the two of you because you're participating in conference that's coming up in October uh, called the AI Enabled Educator. And this is something that we've been talking about at the CPA for quite some time. And a, there are so many different facets of AI and how you can talk about it, how you can think about it. And one of the things that you both were talking about was the ethics behind AI, the ethics of using AI, the ethics of how it was created in the first place. And so I'm hoping that we can jump in there. And Nia, I know that you, uh, this is a particular area of interest for you. Uh, you say you, that you teach how do you use AI in your teaching and how do you approach it with your students? That's a very good question. So since AI is still like, it's not new, but it is new. I noticed when this summer I was going to into the classroom and I was like creating the syllabus for the students. I was like, okay, so these students probably gonna use AI either way, <laughs> if I right. even like allow it or not. So how about me coming up with like a mini policy? Cause SFU has no, not just SFU. I know that every institution is working towards it. And parenthesis, I'm now part of a subcommittee at SFU to come up with policy and guidelines around AI, right? The use of it. So going back to the story, when I was creating the syllabus, I was like, how about me coming up with a minute policy for the course, just to have to, to create the boundaries and also clarify what's accepted, what, what's not, right? And it was a success to be honest, cause like there is a room for, a, for anything in our classrooms, especially since I'm into inclusive education, right? Mm -hmm. And giving the autonomy and choice to students. So what we decided is that collaboratively participatory approach, we came up with the guidelines together with the students learning about AI and how we can ethically use it, right? In terms of like the course, how it went, since it's like a lab course, most of the work was like practical, in-person, doing things. But when it came to the writing parts and research, 
we decided on, you know, being mindful of the information that we are receiving, doing some research that where it's coming from, looking for references and back it up. Even if you're using AI, cite it, right? Use it in our references and say, oh, we actually found this information through AI, whichever tool that they are using. And it actually really worked because students learned, those who were working with the AI, learned how to ethically use it and be open and honest about it. There's no nothing wrong. Like they, the thing is that we forget that AI, it's like basically a big, massive database, right? right. You have to just look for the references and also do your research to support what you are support like bringing in in your arguments right so my students started learning to actually do research and be mindful about information and like what trusting it or not right critical thinking that's mm -hmm. how it started like to come into practice and i think it i at least like to my knowledge and the feedback that we i got it was a success it was like collaborative me and the students but i think like moving forward let's say in the next semester and this coming semester that i'm working with students i still allow like let room to, for students like to practice it and learn to navigate it, but with supervision, I would say, with guidelines. Because if there's no guideline, you're lost, right? right? Even myself as a student, I'm doing research now, I'm working on my thesis, I'm writing a lit review, right? If I want to go back to my old, like, you know, style of writing and doing research, it would take me like forever. But I'm like using AI now as a research assistant, actually. I feed the resources. I uh, provide the references that I'm trying to write my lit review from, right? Yeah. And I honestly communicate with ChatGPT like my research assistant. I ask questions. I trick them to see if they are, if they, uh, if ChatGPT is like actually like present with what I'm like asking. I will, I use like concise prompts. It's like me working my, with my research assistant and it, so far it's been working. So yeah, I yeah. hope I have answered your question. One of the examples that always springs to mind for me is that scene in Jurassic Park where they're talking about how they've gone through the gene sequencing to determine how to fill in the lines of code and it's millions and millions and millions, but these supercomputers can do it fast and no human being would ever be able to do it. Well, in a lot of ways, it can just speed up that kind of process. You also said something that I thought about, which is that it's new, but it's also old, right? That it's been around for a long time. And Leila, I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on this. I was thinking about this yesterday. So do you guys follow baseball? Not at all? No. no. Okay. Well, yeah. for those who are listening currently who do follow baseball, we are recording this on the day after Shohei Otani went six for six with three home runs and went 50-50 for the first time in Major League history. And it was the greatest game of all time presumably, at least that I've ever seen. So I started looking him up and I went on the Google and I started typing in Shohei, so S-H-O, and the things pop up, Shogun, because, you know, my wife and I just watched the Emmys and it won some awards and Short Skirt and the Long Jacket, the song by Kate, because I do a music trivia thing. I was looking that up. But the first prompt that popped up that wasn't something that I'd already searched for before was, should AI be capitalized? And I thought, Okay, this is an AI program that's feeding me what most people or more what they think that I might be searching for as I start typing this in. And it's being very self referential, you know, and that's something that we don't think about as being AI like autocorrect. It's been around forever. Only now it's something a little bit different. So Layla, I'm hoping I can just pick your brain a little bit on what you think about that the the shift from what used to be the AI that we experience in everyday life, autocorrect, autocomplete in Google, you know, uh, the algorithm that tells you who your friends might be on Instagram compared to what chat GPT is and this sort of thing that's causing the furor around AI right now. Yeah, I like, I actually, I'm really happy you asked this question because especially since uh, OpenAI rolled out its uh, GPT model 
in late 2022, I, people increasingly began referring to uh, generative AI as AI. And I think when they say AI, they often mean generative AI, but they don't make that distinction. Because, yeah, as you said, AI has been around since the 70s in some way, shape or form. And the more conversations I have with professionals, accountants, lawyers, whatever, and, and academics, the more I realize that the new problems that they think are attributed to, to AI are simply existing problems that AI magnified. Like think, for example, about this information, this information on social media. Now it's hard to go anywhere, right? Anywhere you begin browsing your browser. And then every at every kind of left turn, right turn, there is like recapture thing or do this to prove you're human. It's almost um, criminalizing nowadays uh, how many how many times I have to prove I'm a human to the computer. But it's true because I think there's an increase. And for example, why it said should AI be capitalized? For example, it's because there's a rise in even like search uh, search uh, terms, right? People a lot of uh, people are uh, now searching more more often about AI, and so that could be attributed to that. But I think, uh, for example, uh, transcription and translation has been used in academia for ages, right? And not a lot of understanding, not a lot of thought was placed on, okay, so how is this tool translating? How is it transcribing? Not a lot of thought was kind of placed on the privacy. You are sending this information to a third party to kind of process in the cloud. But now when kind of ChatGPT rolled out and academia had to deal with this new problem, these old questions that should have been questioned before are starting to emerge again, just because now there's urgency and there's extreme mass adoption among the student body. And I think that's maybe why the issue is, is, is coming up to surface again. But these technologies existed for a while, right? And there, AI is ubiquitous. Like everywhere you look, every tool you use, there is some sort of machine learning involved, at least the ones that are sophisticated enough to be used by users and users would want to use them. And so I think the difference and why there's a, a kind of a panic right now is just because I think it became it became so accessible and so in your face that you're like, okay, okay, so now I kind of draw the connection. So yeah, AI existed before, but now it's generating stuff. It is generating stuff at a at a rate that has never been been done before, right? And so what kind of problems will this create? And so I think and that's why I like um, Nia's policy, like progressive policy around this kind of creating a collaborative and kind of conversation-based rules around AI use because it has existed before and kind of kind of learning from, like we already know how to deal with this stuff at, at some level. It's just kind of shifting the way we think about it. So we, we kind of it kind of integrate this new kind of found knowledge about or, or newfound um, feature of it that is like it's now extremely accessible and that makes sense and and I think you touched on something that I wanted to talk a little bit about there which is that you know people do panic a little because it amplifies the things that have always existed and makes it a little bit easier right it makes it easier for people to do those things uh, like you said mm -hmm. disinformation online for example and there was a time where we would talk a lot about media literacy and you'd want to teach students media literacy. So you're reading these headlines online. How do you know if it's real or not? How do you determine whether a source is credible or not? That sort of thing. And Nia, now you're talking about teaching your students sort of tech literacy. I'm wondering if it's the same challenge, if it's a similar problem, like have, what kind of barriers do you run into trying to teach that uh, to your students? That's a very good question. Um, like, as an educator, when I started like working with AI and also bringing it in, into my classes, it was crucial for me to strike a balance between encouraging my students to use AI tools and ensuring that they rem remain like ethical and responsible, right? I found that students were naturally drawn to the convenience uh, that the AI offers, right? Mm. Especially like in tasks like writing, like writing assistance or quick like feedback on their work. However, I quickly realized that without guidance, some students might misuse AI, right? Such as by using it to generate full assignments or circumventing their own learning process. So to address this, that's why I wanted like to this for for us 
this experiment be participatory and like action research kind of thing, we developed a mini policy together, right? Based on the challenges also they were facing and the questions that they were having. And it was like an ongoing process. It was through the semester. And the things that we were like navigating, the th what we did was like everyone had their own like imagined um, cardboard and writing down their ideas. But what we did was a thematic analysis going through all the ideas and challenges and things that they were like striving for. And we came up with these themes, as I can share with you, it's a very mini policy for the classroom, but I think it, it could apply to any classroom, I would say. The, the themes that came out, I'm, I'm going to pull it up here to just like navigate you through it so you have an idea of how we approached it. And these are the actually the themes that the students came up with, nothing that I did. <laughs> we did it together. So the first policy that we came up with was transparency and honesty, right? With the students, we I asked the students to disclose if and how they used AI in their assignments, right? Whether they used it for brainstorming ideas, refining like their grammar, or, or like I want them to know that even if they're using it, it's totally fine. They have to just be transparent and also them to reflect, oh, this tool is actually AI, right? Like Grammarly, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them think that like some of these, these tools are not, right? Yeah. So that's how they started educating themselves that what are the AI tools? So I wanted them to be transparent about the AI's role in their work. So this helped foster also accountability and honesty, ensuring that like AI didn't replace their creative thinking or critical thinking. The second theme that we come up with was AI as a tool, not a replacement. We emphasize that AI should be like, should work as a supporting tool, right? Something that can enhance learning, but not like, you know, to work for them. For example, I remember I encouraged the students to use AI, I encouraged them to use AI for the task like, like, generating practice problems and scenarios, right? Because in the course that I teach, uh, we one-on-one -on -one work with students with learning disabilities, uh, and I wanted them to get a feel of it before going and practice it in real time, because we have a tutoring camp that we really go in one-on-one, -on -one, work with real students, right? Mm -hmm. So actually coming up with the scenarios and practice problems using the AI worked because like they were like improving their techniques, their practices, their curriculum that they were building. So they still had to engage deeply with the materials themselves, the things that they were learning, right? How to work with students with special needs, but still find like using AI as, as a tool, right? That's right. how they started like learning about it. I can go through all the like themes if you want me to, but I don't want to take up the time. Um, so yeah. Well, we might come back to it. I'm like, I'm thinking, you know, when I was your age, the thing that helped students that was considered cheating were those little books like Cole's notes or Cliff's notes. So mm -hmm. I didn't have time to read a tale of two cities or I never got around to it, or I was just too lazy to open the book, <laughs> but I can get this Cole's notes version of it. And it'll tell me what the themes in the book are, who the characters are. And, you know, and not that I ever did that myself, but had I wanted to do that, I do feel like I probably would have got just about as much out of it because I'm still going to learn about the themes. I'm still going to learn about the way characters relate to one another. And when I do have to write my book report at the end of it, I'll know just as much as I did if I read the book and paid attention in class, I think. And I feel like this is something similar. It feels like a shortcut, but probably isn't in, in, in as much as just saving you a little bit of time, you know? I just wanted to jump in on this idea of uh, students cheating because I find it really fascinating. And going back to like what I said earlier about how AI is magnifying concerns oh. that already exist. So I think a big concern for professors right now is using like students using AI to cheat, which I think is like fair enough. But then I think if we kind of dig deeper into it, I think students who are primed and inclined to cheat would find ways to cheat regardless of the, whether they have access to AI or not. And if and if that's the case, I think it's 
um, it's a pedagogical problem that we are kind of putting on uh, as a technological problem or an like access to AI hence is the problem. And so that's just one thing that I think we need to unpack, at least like professors uh, need to unpack a little bit more th when they are concerned about AI used for cheating and kind of just uh, stripping away the shame and fear around that because I know a lot of professors are also they start their classes putting some sort of AI policy and encouraging students, like if you use AI, cite it and whatnot. But I think there's still hesitance, at least what I heard from some students, that if I cite AI, I'm worried that my professor would like look at me differently or like will treat me differently, et cetera, et cetera. And there's also a point I wanted to make about like AI ethics. So I I know that kind of we're discussing AI ethics and how we can engage with AI ethically and responsibly and we can make rules around that. But I, can't, I kind of also believe that engaging with AI is inherently ethically ambiguous just simply because of how it is made, like from the inception of it. Think about when an architect, right, computer scientist decide I want to make a model, right? So they define the algorithm that this model would optimize for. So like the objective function of the model. And that's by definition is based on what this architect deems is important for the model to look for, right? So right. if you think of predictive policing or even generative AI, so ChatGPT, as sophisticated as it is, it's optimized to predict the next word in a sentence. And so like it doesn't even know what's inside the word, right? And hence we had the whole strawberry thing. And now that's why they rolled out the most recent model, the O1 model. What, what's of, the strawberry thing? Oh, so the strawberry thing. So basically the older version of chat GPT, when it was asked, so GPT-4, 4.0, when it was asked how many R's are in, the, in a strawberry, like the word, it right. would say there are two R's. And even when it's pushed, like to think multiple times, how many R's in strawberry, it would say there are two R's. And the reason it would say there are two R's instead of three is because, so the way that the generative AI works when it writes or when it's learned, when it's trained is that it breaks words into sub words or, or, or words, but it tokenizes them and it turns them into numbers through a process called embedding. And so what it's dealing with is not words, it's actually sub words or tokens. And so when it saw strawberry, it saw strawberry, right? And so it doesn't look inside what's, it doesn't look at the straw or berry as uh, as like characters, but rather as a token. So a full thing, a block of, of text, right? And so okay. that's why it says there are two R's instead of three. But this new model, the uh, O1 model, is supposed to have a new kind of in the training process. It has a chain of thought um, element. And so now if you, they roll in out slowly, some people are having access to it now, I tried it out. But now it's supposed to give, like when you ask it a question, it thinks out, right? Like it takes seconds to write out its thinking process, like the tool writes out its thinking process. And that is meant to basically push the model to reason better. And hence, it's called the strawberry model because it's an improvement on that problem. Okay. Uh, interesting. I think when, you're, when you talk about how it's ethically ambiguous, I can only kind of think from my own perspective. I, I write a lot for, m for my job here. I write profiles of people. I write, uh, you know, summaries of scientific work and that sort of thing. And then, and every now and then someone will say, well, why don't you just use AI? And, and I have actually just a, as an experiment run some stuff through AI. Like I'll talk to you guys. I'll take some notes. I'll put them into chat GPT and uh, see, okay, do it in the style of all these other pieces I've written. And it's, frighteningly close it's not great but it's very close but the the reason i think that i don't do that is maybe it's because i'm an old man and i'm sort of set in my ways and i, I don't like change but it really is because i feel like if it's doing that the origin of chat gpt the origin of generative ai is that it scrubbed everything that was on the internet already so I feel like I'm plagiarizing the work of thousands of people if I then, you know, use that to create the work that I want to create, even though it may well be better than what I can write myself. I don't know. But it's uh, it, it, like that sort of is the, the sense that I get. Does that make any sense? That's the truth. 
That is the truth. The essence of AI is data extractivism, data data coloniality, and just taking the work of people without citing them, right? There's intellectual property theft, and it's a whole gray area. OpenAI is now buying whole catalogs of academic journals without the consent of the academics who wrote the articles. So it's like a profit-seeking thing, right? Both for academic journals and for OpenAI. And yeah, it's true. Um, like, although generative AI is supposed to give you original novels, like words and sentences, sometimes it does replicate uh, sentences or strings of words without attributing them to the right people. And so your fears are 100% based on reality. Well, I feel at least a little validated in that case. That, <laughs> you should uh, be. <laughs> That's why I say it's ethically ambiguous because engaging with it, like you can be responsible in that you can try to learn and understand. But that's a problem with technology or any technological improvement, uh, advancement, isn't it? At the beginning, it's optional. And then it's obligatory because everyone starts adopting it. And if you don't, right. you're left out. And that seems to be what happened here, right? I YouTube wasn't, like, wasn't going to let GPT or generative AI scrub all of YouTube. And then they kind of felt like, well, I guess we have no choice. And it does seem to violate the terms of and conditions of users who uploaded their videos and their content without the intent of having it used for this purpose. But it seems like even the biggest tech companies out there sort of go, well, what are we going to do? We better get on the bus. Uh, and Leila, this is sort of your area, right? Like, what, what do you think about that? Is that something that is an accurate representation of what's happening? A hundred percent. Now it's almost, again, like AI is becoming so ubiquitous, especially every tech company now that wants kind of a revamp introduces AI in some way, shape or form, right? If you want to get investment, introduce AI, become an AI driven platform, whatever. It's like the easiest way now to get some buzz around your tech product or whatnot. And so I think Again, like the idea of things beginning optional and then becoming obligatory. So we saw it in social media, we saw it in, in emails and anything. That's the fear, right? It's almost like this whole conversation about AI ethics reminds me of, I don't know, are you guys familiar with The Good, the good Place? Like the TV show? Yes, yes. yes. I love The Good Place. It, it's a great show, right? Remember when they, re, like, they kind of figured out why most people are going to hell instead of heaven? And the last person who went to he heaven was like this person who lived off the grid? Do you remember or, that? Uh, no, uh, the guy who lived off the grid still couldn't make it into heaven oh, right, because right. of the way that human beings live now, right? The last person to make it to heaven <laughs> was like 1,700 years ago before you had access okay. to, you know, unethical tomatoes. And that's right. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. So exactly. So it's like it's ingrained in like the modern society that you cannot you cannot move an inch without compromising some in some way, shape or form just because of how the system is set up, right? Yeah. Now, you guys have a conference about education and AI coming up, right? The AI-enabled educator. Nia, I understand you're giving a presentation at that conference. Can you give us a preview of that presentation? What are you going to be talking about? I have an idea of like what it's going to be like. I'm usually, even in terms of teaching, Eric, whenever I'm teaching, I'm saying that to me, education is just sharing what I know and my experiences. So that's that would be basically my presentation, like my experience and my students, like working with AI and incorporating in our classroom. That would be like what I know so far and the research that I have done. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out is that AI in, in pedagogy and in, in education, what fascinates me and fascinated, and I was not expecting it with like at all, like with this class that I was working with, I like the idea of like using AI for critical engagement. And I could see the students are, cause like I'm at a stage uh, that I have students who are, exposed to TikTok and their use their attention spans are like 60 seconds to three minutes I would say <laughs> so any information that I was like planning to share that was critical to, to me I would literally like in my syllabus like like work around 60 seconds to three minutes if it was important enough for me to have them like engaged right right 
And so with AI and with it, like what I started experimenting with them, we started like critically engaging with the AI output. Like one of my experiments with the students were this. So I wanted them to engage critically. Why? It, first of all, it encourages critical thinking. Uh, they learn about learning versus efficiency. They also learn uh, accountability. There's so many things, layers like in uh, education, right? That through a tool, like let's say AI, looking at it as a tool, these students can develop these like traits, right? We had deep, deep conversations about originality and integrity, right? We had in-depth conversations, especially, especially regarding plagiarism, clarifying what is plagiarism and what not. So if you think about it in terms of education, a, a, like at least me in my classroom and with the students that I had this semester, we l used AI as a tool to develop our skills and traits. Right. Yeah. And that's, I think, the goal of education, you developing the skills and the traits that you need for further life. So these students, they're becoming teachers, right? Education for 24 students. Mm -hmm. They and as a teacher, you have to be a critical thinker. And I think that's what we did. Like we we try to with the students, we try to also pin out like what is learning, right? and what is versus efficiency. So these students like, you know, working with the AI, they learn that AI can make certain tasks more efficient, right? right. But the process of learning was still vital, right? Mm -hmm. So if they used AI to generate, like, let's say an essay outline, but didn't understand the material, they wouldn't like ultimately, they, they would ultimately struggle in a real classroom setting, right? Yeah. So again, another layer on top of it would be accountability, right? So it was a learning journey, I would say. In the presentation that hopefully we're going to have in the conference, I'm gonna tap on some experiences that we had, some memories and some learning moments, yeah. Excellent, the whole thing then will be a learning journey. Uh, Leila, you're helping to organize this conference can you just you know tell our listeners when it ha when it's happening, where it's happening, and uh, what they can expect to get from attendance? Um, so it's actually fully online. Oh. So it's a fully online event just to make the quality of it uh, like the best possible. So it's a Canada wide event. It's the first of its kind in, in Canada. It's a passion project of mine. I wanted to bring AI literacy uh, into professors because I think universities and institutions are too slow to keep up with what's happening. And I also wanted to kind of provide the space to foster collaboration, interinstitutional learning, and just kind of camaraderie in kind of tackling this big, scary topic. As of today, we have over 200 people signing up. We have people from over 25 universities and the topic, or it's a full day event, and we will be discussing everything from fundamentals of generative AI in an accessible way, how you can engage with it, all the way to how you can apply it in your teaching, how you can regulate it in your classroom, how you can shift your assessment to be AI proof or AI ready, and just kind of helping you by the end of the day, be really confident in your ability to uh, draft up policy around AI, talk to your students about AI, and just um, kind of become an AI-enabled educator. Not necessarily convincing you that you should engage with AI and you should use it, but rather kind of giving you all the information you need so you can make an informed decision. And it's happening October 16th. All right, October 16th, we will put some of the details in the show notes of this podcast episode. So people who are listening now, you can go to the uh, show notes and find out more about this conference. And one last question for you guys. Do you think that it is different for you as young people in that you're more likely to adopt something that quickly? Or do you think that it's something that we can all do and that it shouldn't necessarily be a, a, an age thing that, that allows you to do that? I'm going to go first. I think there is, it sounds cliche, but there's, no, I think it's never late to learn. And I would say, especially with AI, through COVID, we learned, I, I was like, again, my personal experience, I was living with this healthcare worker 
who is like now retired she was in her, she late seven, like late 60s 70s so she had to learn giving consultations through zoom right and it was a struggle for everyone like at first like yeah. figuring things out and like so if he, and she adapted right she picked it up in a week or so just like trying to figure it out and learn right and i don't think we ever eric stop learning no matter what age we are, I think the day that we stop learning, it's the day that we die, right? Yeah. So it is never to learn too late, or it's not, to, in my opinion, there's no connection, there's no correlation between age and AI, right? Yeah. It's something that we have to, like anything else, I shared last time that we had a chat, my grandma, like she resisted using WhatsApp and doing video calls, like saying that, oh, you guys have to like visit me and like, I'm not gonna use phones and yeah, anyone who wants to see me come to my place. Right. But then COVID happened and she, she's, she was like, you know, she had to learn, right? It comes to a point that you have to pick up things if you wanna survive. And yeah, I think that's the case with AI too. I just wanted to kind of highlight that um, it's a misconception that younger people are more, I mean, generally, yeah, young people are more tech savvy, more tech inclined, but there are students who are completely against AI, deathly scared that it's going to take their jobs, especially as you know, you graduate, you have some entry job, entry level job, and those are going to disappear in the coming couple years, right? And so some people, some students my age, some people my age are really scared of AI, and some older people I find really excited about it just because they saw like how previous technological advancement kind of shifted the world, the way the world worked. So I don't know if we can make this um, like it's a young people thing. I wonder if it seems like a young people thing only because young people tend to be more exposed to new technologies. And since older people have already found the methods and tools that work best for them and have less inclination to learn something that may or may not be helpful, I don't know, but that's a discussion for another time. Like I said off the top, there is no way to cover this whole topic in one podcast episode, but I thank Nia and Layla for joining me to at least cover part of the basics. And thanks to you at home for streaming, downloading, and reviewing today's episode. Mindful is written, hosted, and published by me, Eric Bullman. Our producer and editor is Jamie Montgomery, and our theme song is Avenues by David Taylor. 